Hello, everyone. Good evening. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Library Trustees meeting of February 8, 2022. The time is 6.01 p.m. I'll invite Jinder to call the roll. All right, it seems like we have a quorum, right, Henry? We can start. All right, Trustee Cortez. Here. Trustee Hahn. Trustee Lentini. Here. Trustee Vadat. Chair Ducuse. Here. <clears throat> uh, great, I'll invite Gender to explain how the public can participate in this evening's agenda. Okay, good evening, everyone. Viewers are welcome to provide public comment online through Zoom or by telephone at 253-215-8782. And the meeting ID is 8801453-1177 pound. If you are watching the meeting on Zoom and wish to provide public comment, please select the raise hand feature either on the bottom of your screen or through the participants icon. If you are participating by telephone and wish to provide public comment, please press star nine when the chair opens the public comment period. When it is your turn to speak, you will be notified that the host is inviting you to participate. You will need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you are unmuted, you will have three minutes to provide your comments. Thanks, Jinder. Are there any amendments to this evening's agenda? Um, I'll uh, call, well, I'll call the agenda item. Uh, the first uh, item is approved regular meeting minutes of January 11, 2022. Are there any questions from trustees to staff? Any public comment? Uh, there are no attendees. Okay. All right, so that closes public comment and request uh, of staff to respond to questions during public comment, because there was none. So sh should I call uh, board members alphabetically for their comments or? I think we make a I motion take... to approve the minutes. We're there. Um, or I can just request a motion. Can anyone motion? I'll move to approve the minutes as submitted. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, Jindo, can you roll call the vote? Trustee Cortez. Aye. Trustee Hahn. Aye. Trustee Lentini. Aye. Trustee Vadat. Chair Ducues. Aye. Okay, so I'll call the second agenda item, which is introductions, awards, recognitions, presentations, new library video game collection. And we have Basha Jedruszak, uh, librarian. Hi, Basha, and uh, Hello. hopefully you can tell me how to pronounce your name correctly. <laughs> that was very close. It is Basha Jedruszak. Great. Um, so I do have a presentation prepared. Um, if I can share my screen. Let me see. Okay. Okay, is this visible? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I would like to start this off that um, I am presenting this on behalf of my colleague, Matthew Hurley. Um, they're the person who um, uh, put through the funding request. Um, they put this entire video game collection and I want to make sure that their work is acknowledged because they have been um, kind of at the, um, at the head of all of this. Um, so what's happening with this video game collection is, um, we are 
trying to introduce video games to the community. Um, libraries have a, um, a long history of debate about, around the role of the collection within the community. Um, should it focus on leisure, education, or art? Um, what kind of, what balance of the three, um, depending on the community? Um, video games are a medium that contribute to all three of those areas. They're a leisure activity, they provide education, and they are a form of art. And part of the motivation to, um, to add these is that we already lend a lot of non-book formats to, um, to the public. We lend DVDs, CDs, park passes, ukuleles, um, plenty of other libraries throughout Marin County and throughout the United States lend other things. There are tool libraries. Um, we lend storytime kits with puppets. Um, and so now video games are being added to this, um, this non-book collection. Um, and statistics indicate that this is something that is going to be engaged with pretty highly in the community. Um, video games account for about 35% of leisure hours spent with media for Americans under the age of 40. And for all Americans, it's 20% of their leisure time spent with media. So it's a pretty significant part of how, um, how people in America engage um, with, with media in general. Um, and so this pilot program was um, researched by my colleague by looking at existing video game collections um, with public libraries as well as university libraries. So for example, UC Santa Cruz, University of Washington, um, the Lawrence Public Library in Lawrence, Kansas did um, a huge amount of, of work contributing to, um, you know, spending time with Matthew, answering their questions. Um, so huge shout out to the Lawrence Public Library and all the staff members there. Um, so our pilot program was um, created with a budget of $2,000 provided by the Friends of the Library. Um, the pilot collection size is going to be 42 items spread between three gaming systems, PlayStation 5, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. And the pilot location chosen for this collection is the Northgate branch of the San Rafael Public Library. So why Northgate? Um, Northgate is already uh, a sort of experimental branch for us. That's where the majority of our new technologies go, such as the 3D printer and um, our VR headsets pre-pandemic. Um, and Northgate also tends to draw more teens, which is a cohort and a slice of the community that we don't really engage with very strongly. Um, so we're hoping that um, because video games are of high interest to teens as well as other adults under 40, um, then this might help draw more teen patrons into the library. Um, and then the third component of why we've decided to go with the Northgate branch of the San Rafael Public Library is that Northgate is a non-foldable collection which means that patrons will not be able to request these items um, and so would have to come into the library physically. And this also means that patrons, once an item is returned, it will go directly back onto the shelf so that the next patron um, can see it and browse for it easily, makes for a slightly more accessible collection that way. And then the selection criteria that Matthew used when they were selecting um, titles for um, this pilot collection mostly broke down into three categories, which is to say timeliness, appeal, and popularity. Timeliness, um, Matthew chose the a lot of newer titles, titles that were released predominantly within the last three years pending availability. So for example, um, they've selected Horizon Forbidden West, which is a game that has not been released yet, as well as a couple of other brand new titles. Um, and again, pending availability, some of these titles um, were released concurrently for the PlayStation 4 and the PlayStation 5. So we do have a couple of um, previous generation games, but they are new. And as far as the appeal goes, um, we purchased games for, um, for the entire spectrum of, of the community that we serve, for children, for families, for teens, for adults. We have multiplayer games, we have single player games, we have games that are aimed for all ages, games aimed specifically at children, at teens, at older teens, at adults. Um, and then of course, uh, preference was given to titles that are really popular um, and titles that um, 
have reviewed, have, have been well reviewed, have received accolades and, and awards um, in a similar vein to the way that, that we choose um, our other non-book materials and our book materials as well. And then here are some photos of uh, the Northgate branch over here. Um, this is what our display area is going to look like. We've got it set up into Switch games, PlayStation games, and Xbox games. Um, and we don't have anything set out yet because the, the items are still in process. And then on the right hand side here, we've got um, the social media post that went out last week as sort of a teaser to the community that we haven't um, officially set out word um, because the items are still in process and we don't know exactly when they're going to be um, sent out to the public yet. And uh, that was a lot of information pretty quickly. So I am open to comments or questions. Any I just questions? A, from yeah. I just have a question. I just want to make sure I understand. When you mentioned it's a no hold location, it, does that mean people are coming in to play the games in the library? Is that what that means? And you have no. actually. Okay. Yeah, so they can be checked out. It's just that once you check out an item, so say um, I decided to check out Hades and um, someone else wants to check out that game, they have to wait for me to return it. They can't place a hold on it like for, for it. other books. It, it prevents a queue from backing up. Right, right. And then um, is the time that someone can check it out the same as books? Yes, it's three weeks, just like our other media materials. So CDs okay. and audiobooks, or CDs, audiobooks, and DVDs also have the same checkout time. Okay, great. No, thank you. Um, With the, a question: With the uh, uh, no no fees, uh, no late fees, you know what? Because I imagine there's going to be a lot of folks that may want to. There, a, a higher incentive to hold on to some of these, maybe a, a little more than some of the books. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? You cut out right in the middle. Oh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, you know, if, the, if the, the, the checkout period is the same as books, does the kind of the no late fee uh, policy apply to that? Yes, that's, that goes well? for all of our items. Okay. And how long has the pilot been going on? Sorry. That. It hasn't started yet. It hasn't started. Okay. Yeah. So the um, items are still in process and, and we're likely not going to put them out at least for I think a minimum of, of two more weeks, give or take. We'll see. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I just may want to think about, you know, what maybe some counteractions may be if uh, people are actually are not returning these, because I could see that being a little bit of a difference between uh, a book and a, and a popular video game. Sense, That's true, but at the same time, we do also lend out long DVD series, like a TV series that have a similar price point, if not higher, um, and a similar like length of consumption time. Um, and, and patrons, if they lose the item or if it doesn't get returned, um, will be beholden to the same lost fee as as for any other item. Um, Basha, uh, thank you so much for your presentation and for filling in for Matthew. I hope uh, Matthew is okay. Um, but but this is great presentation. I really engaged with the with the graphics and you know the video game theme. And also this is the London um, uh, you know landmark building that you have here in the background. I lived there for 15 years, so <laughs> it brings good memories. <laughs> But that aside, um, so I was curious about the selection of the video games. I don't know much about video games, but I also didn't notice any of the ones that are notorious for things like violence or fostering, you know, um, things like addiction or, you know, a lot of purchases uh, that might, you know, engage in, you know, negative outcomes for, for the user. So I'm, Pretty sure, you know, if I ask a question, what was your criteria for selection in terms of, you know, those kinds of things, choosing the the games that have those positive outcomes that you mentioned at the beginning, um, but just wanted to, you know, get a little bit more 
if you have on, on the specific game selection? Yes. Um, so I obviously cannot speak for Matthew as, as they are the person who selected them, but I know that they did so in accordance with our collection development policy, which governs all of the items that we purchase. This includes DVDs, which can be R-rated. This includes books, which may include um, violent scenes or scenes that are considered graphic in some way. Um, so everything that we have selected is selected according to our collection development policy. That's great. Thanks for answering that. Um, any public comment? Do we still have no attendees from the public? I believe that Jamie had her their hand raised. Her hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry, Jamie. That's okay. I mean, I kind of had the same question in general, you know, obviously we're not the police or guardians of what people check out or don't, but I was kind of curious as well as thinking about it might be more enticing for younger people to get a video game that might be out of their age range and just thinking, just wondering what, you know, I don't really know what is the library is there a policy around that or is I that's actually something I should know after being here for five years. Yes, I actually have the collection development policy in front of me and I can quote it to you. Perfect. Well, you already got it. Hey. <laughs> yes. Um, so the collection development policy, um, which was updated in January 2022, states that the responsibility for the reading choices of minors rests with their parents or legal guardians and selection of adult material will not be restricted by the possibility that these items may come into the possession of children, nor does the library use any system of coding, rating, or labeling to identify or segregate materials for purposes of censorship. Interesting. Okay. Um, thank you, Basha. Uh, the shorthand for the way we explain it to parents is almost exactly verbatim. The, the conversation be about the appropriateness of any particular item is between the parent and the child and not between us and the, 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 the patron. So we kind of push it back onto um, the legal guardian or parent to have the conversation about, you know, what's appropriate. And we do, you know, stock a, a variety of materials. Um, this came up with, when we talked to the friends about this in terms of the funding of the collection. And it's a kind of a recurring theme that we have, you know, to repeat, uh, you know, that that almost specifically exactly what Basha said. Thank you. Thanks for the answer. I was just curious. I appreciate it. Adriana, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> questions from trustees or questions from the public? Uh, no public comment. Okay, so I will uh, continue to agenda item three, public comment from the audience. Oh, sorry. Um, awesome work, Basha. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Basha. <laughs> Very excited about this new format. Uh, yeah, definitely. So, sorry. So, item three is public comment from the audience regarding items not listed on the agenda. Uh, no uh, comment. Agenda? No? Okay. All right. So, then item four, fiscal year 2021-2022, second quarter annual revenue and expenditure budget reports. Henry. Yes, that would be me. Um, I will be presenting the fiscal year 2122, which which ends uh, June 30th, 2022, second quarter annual revenue and expenditure budget report. Everyone should have a staff report and um, a spreadsheet. I will start with a presentation and then I have the spreadsheet uh, on deck if we need to look at that. Uh, I will be sharing my screen.
Okay, I'm not seeing it. Nope, can't see it. Okay. We could see it when you were not in presentation mode. Yeah. I don't know if that helps, but. Okay, redo. Oh, I know what happened. Pardon me for technical difficulties. All right. <laughs> Okay. Can you see I, it? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. So, so I'm, I'm uh, going to kind of fly through a little bit, but um, I, sh I should get everything here. So um, this is the review of the fiscal year 2021 second quarter library budget. Um, we do this quarterly as of uh, the second quarter, our budget is, is, 50% expended. Um, our overall activity, the budget consists of two budget main budget areas, the, the general fund and the um, parcel tax. So those combined um, are 49% expended. We're slightly over in general fund and under in parcel tax. Um, the general fund expenditure, again, you you that have seen this before is significantly higher due to the large one-time payment to MarinNet about 200, 300,000. Without that, we, it would be calculated out to be 49% expended. And parcel tax expenditures ended at 38% because we are we have some staff vacancies. The major part of the parcel tax, which is around a million out of a $4 million budget is devoted to staffing because it's or it's basically about operations. Um, revenue highlights. Um, general fund is about 71% of operating expenditures. Parcel tax is about 28%, you know, roughly of the $4 million budget that rounds out to 3 million and 1 million. And the friends contribute about 1% of operating expenditures. Uh, the general fund revenue, we don't get a lot of revenue from general fund. We get about $12,000 from the state library as a disbursement of funds through our statewide consortium, NorthNet. Uh, Friends of the library are expected to contribute a, a little under 30000 and the parcel tax budget is where we get our main revenue source from the parcel tax per parcel assessment. And that's about a million and a hundred, uh, one million one hundred thousand ish for this year. It's always a moving target because there's a senior property tax exemption that constantly is 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 lessening what we get each year. And then every year we have a cost of living increase up to three percent, which we calculate sometime in April. Uh, expenditure highlights from the general fund. Um, our extra higher temp employees are slightly higher as we were spending down the general fund before parcel tax funds. We have lines in both this line in both funds. Uh, building maintenance contracts and maintenance building improvement are higher due to annual maintenance contracts. For example, the, the, the AC people came to change the filters and they don't bill sort of incrementally on an ongoing basis. We get the bills all at once and it's not, it, it usually doesn't, it's either lesser or greater than we were expecting in this sense, greater. Contract expenditures are overspent as, as you know, the Marin net bill is paid at the beginning of the year that I referenced earlier. And uh, we've been spending um, the book budget first in the general fund. So you'll see, don't be alarmed, all of our book money in general fund is spent, but we have a ton more in the parcel tax. Uh, audio visuals is also overspent, but we won't, won't be over, but going over budget, travel and conference training instruction are underspent, but CLA is in Sacramento this year. And I just found out today that, 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 that two, um, 
two conference proposals proposed by our staff have been accepted. We're very excited. Um, so we, we're planning to send a number of people to our local state conference this year. And since it's in the north, it, it rotates between north and south. It's been in Pasadena, San Diego. Um, it's been in Sacramento, San Jose, and Santa Clara. But this year it's in Sacramento, very convenient. Professional dues and subscriptions are underspent as only staff involved with professional organizations directly have been encouraged to pay for those memberships because that decreases you know, the cost of any conference you attend. And credit card fees line is, has not been budgeted, but it's still there. It's sort of vestigial. We get charged by the credit card company for, for transactions but we haven't been doing hardly any of those you know, in the current fiscal year as we no longer charge fines and there's fewer book replacements and the circulation is way down. Um, expenditure highlights parcel tax, the county administrative fee, the county charges us a fee to collect the parcel tax for us as part of your property tax through the county and that's managed by the city finance. It's overspent now, but it won't go over in total at the end of the fiscal year. Contract services expenditures line is not budgeted. This line is where we'll be paying for, um, we pay for things like the new library conceptual design project, which some of you have been on the committee for that conceptual design in Albert Park. So we we're paying the rest of the money we owe Nolan Tam out of this line, a small amount, less than $2,000. And we'll also be budgeting, um, the money we're going to pay Godby Research Associates for a survey that's currently happening with this city residents with regards to the a new library and a funding mechanism to, to support that. And that money will be moved around from the capital set aside in Measure D and put through this line in the budget to pay for those two things. The Nolan Tam contract was around 70000 and the Godby research around 30,000. Programming supplies expenditures are underspent due to reduction in programming. We've done a ton of virtual programming, but it doesn't require as many supplies. So we did some make and take things, which were very popular. Um, we, we may go back to more in-person programming in the near future, but that, you know, we just haven't been spending that much. And in measure, the parcel tax measure, like I said, we have a ton of book money, but we haven't spent it all yet because we're spending the general fund money first because parcel tax money, key fact, unlike the general fund, if we don't spend all the parcel tax money, it, it, it doesn't go away. So we kind of use the two funds strategically, I would say. But the general fund money, if we don't all spend it all, it does go away. Um, periodicals, we suspended those during the pandemic shutdown because there was no one in the building to read them. So we're still like re-upping periodicals. If you visit our downtown branch or other branches, you'll see periodicals starting to reappear. Um, digital branch expenditures, it should say underspent, but we're continually overspent. We're, we're continually monitoring these and we're not going to go over um and technology supplies and materials are underspent but we have additional hardware needs as we have more and more people coming into the library we have a lesser amount of public computers right now so we're looking at sort of reacting to that when necessary to get a few more computers and when we onboard new staff members we may have additional um, expenditures for example we just decided to replace some of our aged monitors which, which really isn't in the replacement schedule right now from digital. So that comes out of technology supplies. And we're underspent in training instruction because so many free trainings available online. That concludes my presentation. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Henry. Any comments or questions from trustees? Um, Henry, I guess I have a technical question. So when you say something has been overspent but not over budget, does it mean that the overspend is going to be 
funded with other? Ah, very good question. Um, that's that's very good. It means we're overspent compared to it. We're not over a budget, but from a severely kind of like logical standpoint, like a very sort of like if everything was incremental, which it never is, we would only be at 50% of everything for, for at the quarter for everything. So if we're at 51, you know, we're overspent, even though we're not going to go over budget. Over budget would be like 100 plus percent. And with some mm -hmm. bottom line budget items, like we had done a bottom line budget last year because we're way over in this and under in that. But overspent just means that we're, we're, over, we're, we're, we're not on target. Mm -hmm. You know, like a perfect budget would be everything would be 50% on the money. It would be like, don't buy a paperclip because we'll be over budget. <laughs> buy it in the next quarter. Mm -hmm. But but just to, to we're looking at trends. So so it, there's like a interplay between the amount in the line and how much we're overspent. So we were like 1% over in personnel expenditures, which is like a huge thing. So that's something we talked to finance about. And we're like, is everything okay? And they're like, yeah, that's cool. If we were like 10 or 15% over and then like a multi-million budget line, we would kind of be like, Arr. so So that's exact. It means not over budget, but just over that, over that. that target. Mm -hmm. Got it. And shout out to Jinder for being the main mover on all this, putting the numbers together, analyzing. He actually drafted the report and um, and does the, the the heavy lifting of of the rolling up the numbers uh, every quarter. Hats off. <laughs> Thank you, Jinder. Any other questions from trustees? Questions from the public? Thanks, Henry. Um, no comments. Okay. And this is one of those um, accept the report and provide feedback. So no, uh, there's no like a motion, right? So no. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I can just move to the next item, right? Great. No questions on the budget. <laughs> uh, so item five, allergy awareness signage update. Is that yes. you, Henry? That would be me again. I've learned from last time. I, I had my slideshow actually at the end and it was at a black screen. That's why it looked crazy because I had run through it before. But now I have it at the beginning. I'm ready to share my screen. All right. So um, this is a, a, a presentation that our allergy awareness signage process to date and an update on that. Um, so, we want to change it real quick to 2022. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, just pretend you didn't see that. Well, just as it moves forward publicly, you may want to. Oh, wait, I can, I can escape and then fix it. Wait, wait, I can fix it without escaping. Uh, there's the shame. Okay. All right. This should fix it. Oh, the magic. There we go. Okay. So uh, last meeting, January 11, 2022, we brought some signs during the, um, the city librarian comments. Um, and that engendered the request West, the board then requested that we bring this back because there's been a there's been a sort of series of events over more than the past two years. Um, also, I'm just reiterating from last meeting, there was a suggestion of the inclusion of graphics of all various nuts and for updated the Spanish language translation to include more than just walnut types like peanuts, which is very helpful. And um, also the suggestion of more of an explanation of what the phenomenon may be, because it seems to be a hyper-local sort of concern, but, you know, people, other people from other parts of the world might not understand it in the same way and sort of, you know, more of, of a like educational, you know, signage, which is all very helpful. Um, a little background. 
so back in 2019, the, the sort of origin of this discussion is that we updated the guidelines for library use to allow limited consumption of food within the library, which it depends on what you're used to, but um, like libraries I've worked at did allow limited consumption and we worked with, we actually copied the Pleasanton libraries rules of behavior to not outright ban food because um, you know, people sort of eat anyway and, and they kind of hide the evidence. It, 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 it seems overly punitive. Uh, you know, we had a, we had a conversation at the time. And at that time, the concern was voiced about the verbiage to make library patrons aware of the hazards of consuming peanuts and tree nuts and related food products, particularly in the children's area. Uh, further on in the year, November 19th, we developed some verbiage and presented it to the board for the review and consideration. Made, they made some suggestions about where to post the signage and making it available in both English and Spanish. And we, we notified the board that we would be running it by the city attorney's office. That was in November 12, 2019. To, for review and recommendations, which they did review on the meeting of February 11th, 2020, the, the day right before the shutdown. Um, staff summarized the concerns and discussions around nut allergies, and we've shared the feedback from the city attorney's office, which, which advised us with regards to rules about the consumption of nuts and nut-based food products in the library, specifically the children's area. Um, and then, you know, this past meeting, January 11th, we finally brought back some updated nut signs and, and the Board of Trustees requested that this be brought to this meeting. I'm developing a timeline here. Uh, some discussion. Um, Board of Trustees had previously suggested that staff develop signage that would serve as a warning and raise awareness. Um, the draft verbiage developed and shared with was developed and shared with City Attorney's Office. They recommended strongly, I would say, that the signage should serve to raise awareness rather than prohibit the consumption of nuts entirely. Um, and and this was sort of explored a little bit last meeting. You know, we take their recommendation as direction um, because I think the way it was described was if we make a policy saying this is a nut free zone or, you know, no nuts in here as an official policy, then we would be liable if someone were to consume nuts. And, and specifically when the city attorney says they would recommend not to do that our senses than to follow that recommendation. Um, this was a, one of the previous draft signs in English. That's more about, you know, overtly saying that we can't provide a totally nut free space and to say, you know, please don't bring nuts into the library, you know, in order to, you know, you know, kind of be, a, be, be mindful of people who may be affected maybe deathly allergic to these things. And then we had this version in Spanish, um, which we'd be open to feedback on in terms of whether this is a good translation. Uh, then that's, you know, uh, at the last meeting, no, in February 11th, 2020, the meeting before the pandemic, and I'm just quoting from the notes, um, the, there was recommendation that, that language which such as nut free zone should be like very prominent in response to the previous signs. And please do not bring items with nuts into the area. I think we have that, but th that was discussed. And the graphic showing various types of nuts. So, so you saw the previous sign only showed what appeared to be a peanut. And then just for, for, for reference, these are the signs that we had last week. I think we hit the mark with various types of nuts though I don't see what looks like a peanut. I see like what I think might be a Brazil nut. And um, please, nut free zone, please do not bring items with nuts into the area. And then Adriana made the observation that new oasis sort of implied walnuts-ish rather than like 
peanuts, which, you know, peanuts arguably being the, of the most concern, but not the only tree nut that we're concerned about. So that sort of like a journey into the past about where we've been with this discussion without actually moving it forward, but to sort of summarize for the board's current discussion. And now is the time for comments and questions. I can stop sharing my scene unless someone wants to refer to either of those graphics, but I could bring them up also. Henry, I thought at the last meeting you said um, you were gonna work on the, you were gonna come back with new language on that new signage. I thought that's what we were gonna be well, we decided that it would be more useful to just catch everyone up on all the language that we've had. So, so we're 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 willing to develop new language, but we just wanted to kind of reiterate the discussion today for the members that hadn't been part of that discussion. We've been a little busy with with Omicron, and um, we're back to our regular hours, and we're down a bunch of staff, so. We weren't able to develop new language at this point, but but we, you know, looking at the history of all the previous stuff that we discussed, we thought it would be, I thought it would be useful just to kind of bring everyone back to, up to speed with the history. No, I think, I mean, that's useful, but I also thought we were going to move a little bit more forward today, hopefully, because, I mean, the library is open again, so we definitely want to get something in place. So I was hoping for, for questions or comments with regards to the specific verbiage and, um, you know, that built upon the previous comments made. So we're, we're open to your, to your suggestions. So then the green signs are the most recent iteration, the last ones you showed? Uh, yes. Can you put those back up, please? Sure. Okay, and so so the last comments on these had to do with now the peanut graphic is missing entirely and that maybe the translation wasn't quite right for the encompassing all the types of nuts. But then I guess the other thing missing that I thought looked like you you mentioned had been discussed is some kind of accompanying education material that like explains like why, like why are you even asking for a nut free zone and how it's dangerous to people. So I was just wondering kind of where you landed on, like, is there a secondary sign that might be with this or off to the side? Cause I like how this is so much simpler with fewer words and the, you know, making the nut free zone graphic larger and all of that and the picture and it's, you can very quickly get the idea. So that looks like it works well in terms of a graphic composition. But now I'm wondering how do we get the educational piece in there? Cause I mean, honestly, like uh, this whole nut allergy thing is really new to me since living in Marin County. I mean, and so I would love to know, I mean, I, I get it. I understand people are allergic, but how is that gonna be handled? Oh my gosh. I, at first I thought it was, we're going to have to reproduce like the Carnegie sign and get it laminated, but we have a librarian answer to this and it's a book display. Oh. Like we pull a bunch of books from the kids collection about nut allergies and we do a little book display and we have education material already provided, you know, with some signs. And I think that would kind of nail it, you know, because, because you know, we wouldn't have to recreate the wheel, and we could just kind of provide, you know, educational materials right there from from the collection that we're actually, you know, in at the time. Okay, so your idea is that wherever where you place these signs, someone could readily see that educational display of additional material if they want to understand more. Yeah. yeah okay. The children's staff have been awesome in, in doing rotating book displays on an, on an ongoing basis. And it really kind of is one of the, the highlights of the children's room. Okay. So are they at all the tables, Henry, as well? Uh, we, we, would, we would strategically place them around the room. Not, not, I don't think at every single table, though we do have table toppers 
in the teen area that say um, this area is reserved for teens and people working with teens, but we could consider that also that 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 would be, but it would we we can do both. We we want to um, re, re get a new word for nuts in Spanish, um, and then we could go with this graphic, including maybe a peanut. I don't see a peanut in there that I could actually mm -hmm. identify. <laughs> And is it the idea that someone like as soon as they walk in the library will be able to see these signs like the idea is that the whole library is in a free zone is that the concept. Uh, no, my understanding was it was mainly about the children's area and we weren't making a policy that the library was okay. not, was what nuts not allowed but this area, please do not bring nuts here. Okay. Uh, so regarding the comment, yeah, of, of the Spanish, so it may apply to English as well. Just, I mean, there's a whole uh, verbiage around, is it nuts, but like almonds, does everyone know if almonds is a nut? Peanuts are technically beans, not nuts. Like, not to get too technical, <laughs> but um, so that's why the pictures are useful. Um, but, and so the same thing happens with Spanish. I mean, nueces definitely refers more to walnuts. I saw in the previous slide they had from 2020, it used cacahuates, which is the Aztec word, but someone in Guatemala or Colombia might not recognize it. It's, you know, sorry. And the same thing happens with English from different uh, countries, right? So not to overcomplicate, but maybe um, just the, the visuals. And I remember someone also mentioned, you know, it's not just the nuts themselves, but like a, a cereal bar that might have nuts. And this is, I mean, I, I remember preschool with my kids uh, and at school, uh, it's, there's a little bit of that sort of information right. just for the, for those who have not been exposed to allergies before. Um, so I guess my suggestion or comment is, uh, yes, we need to educate the public. But let's do it as simple as possible without using every English and Spanish word known to mankind um, to refer to these allergens. Yes, I could see s some some iterations on on the Spanish words for nuts um, and an additional um, about nut products, maybe in in the, the, the smaller text and then maybe a footnote at the bottom sort of explaining briefly about the phenomenon of nut allergies and how life threatening they can be. Yeah, they can cause anaphylaxis. Well, we also have a lot of friends and every friend is different. Like some are allergic to some things and some are allergic to other things. So uh, that's where people might get as confused as I have been in the past. <laughs> I think the difference though is, and I agree, there's plenty of different allergies, but most of them are not as fatal as a nut allergy, right? Or as a peanut, specifically a peanut allergy. Um, and so Henry, I appreciate that this is trying to be like clean and, you know, a nice clean graphic, but honestly, I feel like in the kids area, it needs to be basic, like a picture of a granola bar or a picture of like, what looks like to be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something. Like I appreciate this is like really nice, but the issues were when you're coming into the kid's library as I've done for a majority of my daughter's life is that's what kids are eating. They're opening up a granola bar, right? That's the thing or a little bit of a sandwich that has peanut butter and things like that. That's That was always like in story time. I know we're not doing that anymore, but I, I didn't, I'm just saying you know, anecdotally, um, I did not see people just bringing a nut. And I know that that's not what you're trying to portray. You're not saying that that's what it is. But I think a graphic that really shows like these are what people are actually bringing and eating. And that's the problem rather, I think is where that's where I would lean towards. Sure. So, um, okay. Just to reiterate, uh, nut free zone. Please do not bring items with nuts and nut products, and then graphics that include processed nuts, sort of like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a granola bar. And then at the bottom, 
like a little bit of a footnote about what this phenomenon sort of entails just to explain. And with the caveat that we're gonna use some, some more expansive Spanish language nouns for not beyond the oasis or the Aztec word. I think we can do it. Awesome, and then my final comment, can we not make it green? Because green seems like go and it's okay. It just seems like that's just me out. Can we just make it yellow or something? Well, I think it might reflect we had some recent painting in the in the oh, kids room that okay. was green, but but uh, yeah, like another color, reddish. Yeah, more like halt. <laughs> um, the previous signs were blue and red and white, so uh, maybe with the inclusion of the red circle and the. The uni is that a universal right. sign for no? But yes, um, that that we could do that. And then how about we we just bring it back for a final, um, you know, during the city librarians report next time. Yeah. So we we can do this. <laughs> we can do this. Two years later, we're almost there. Okay. Any other questions or comments? from members, questions or comments from the public? No. No? Thank you, Henry. Oh. You're hey, welcome. Thanks. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Great, uh, agenda item six, other brief reports on any meetings, conferences, and or seminars attended by board members. Any board members? Okay, item seven, brief program updates on reports on any meetings, conferences, and seminars attended by staff. Yes, this is traditionally where I talk a lot, though Susan also. Um, so I'll start. Um, our, one of our supervising librarians is, is leaving us at the end of the week. Jamie Poirier has a new position as deputy county County Deputy Director at Solano County. So uh, we will miss her. We're re actively recruiting for her replacement, but no one can replace Jamie. And so, you know, we're sad. There, there, there's a, um, we could share with you the Kudo board, which is a tradition virtually since people have, since the pandemic, which is an online way to kind of share your thoughts if any of you not some of you might not have met her but that's that's one of the things um i mentioned the godby survey which is huge um godby is the um the the research group we the city uses for many um you know exploring the viability of a funding mechanism so this survey will be lo looking at um getting getting um the community's reaction to a property transfer tax and also getting some information about library locations their first half they're doing two runs the first run has ended and i think they got about 600 their target was 600 plus uh, responses so so um it's working we're moving forward it's probably since i've been here in the project of building and building a new library the most significant step so far um, it may not seem like it, but but it really is letting us narrow into you know the the possibility of putting something on the ballot in November, and it's very exciting. Um, and that again will be coming from the Measure D Parcel Tax Capital Set Aside Fund. Um, our last Marin Net Board meeting was at the end of January. We have two new directors in Marin Net. Uh, I think I've mentioned Lana Ad Adlawan is the new county librarian for Marin County Free Library. And we have a new director at Belvedere Tiburon, Crystal Duran. We were lucky enough to have um, Patty Wong, who is a 
the library director for Santa Clara City Library previously of Santa Monica and previous to that of Yolo County. And she is this year's um, ALA president, which is a big deal. And she attended our meeting and we talked about equity, diversity and inclusion, you know, as a group. And the, the, the board has been having an equity conversation for the past year. And, and Patty is kind of, uh, this is one of her specialties. She's the first Asian American ALA president, I believe. And we had a great, a great meeting and we'll be reflecting upon that at the next meeting. Um, NorthNet board is the, the, the consortium that contains MarinNet. It's an official CS California State Library consortium from Marin to the Oregon border to Nevada and down to Sacramento. All those libraries are in one big consortium. They met to about a week ago, yeah, a week ago, to decide a lot of things, but we're not able to reach quorum for, for a, a, some kind of procedural wrinkle, which was that if the representative from that, that jurisdiction wasn't at the address, the official address of the jurisdiction, i.e. the library, where the notice, public notice for that had been presented, then they couldn't vote. So it presented that NorthNet consortium from doing any business related to you know approving um, reciprocal lending between the NorthNet overdrive collection and the MarinNet one. But, but but I'm not sure why that was decided, but it definitely you know got in the way of doing business. Um, other than that, the, the, the NorthNet consortium has been very active in disaster preparedness and it's done a project on that. And it's gonna do some more on that particularly because many of the pl the places even more so than us had like active fires and libraries burning down and earthquake and you know so so that's one of the grant funded projects northnet has been working on which is exciting and every every library within it had been buddied up with another library in terms of disaster preparedness um, for us, you know, we, our our kind of disaster response really rotates around the EOC and just FYI, with the new public safety building, our emergency operations center is no longer at the county, but is now across the street as part of the public safety building. And we did we did a, an operation, uh, an exercise called. Golden Eagle, <laughs> which is like a role play of an earthquake and all city employees, you know, our emergency workers. So that was very exciting. And to do it actually in the public safety center in our own emergency operations center. This was, you know, a while ago, a couple months ago, but that was great. Um, and then the friends of the library met in in um, in January and approved three new funding requests. The video game collection, which generated a lot of discussion and shout out to Matthew Hurley, our senior library assistant, who was very thoughtful about you know the role of video games in the sort of popular culture which is kind of a recent phenomenon and and you know the friends approved funding that and we're very excited about the new video game collection they also improved a collection of dry bags that we're going to distribute to people experiencing homelessness so they won't have the barrier to access or the fear of getting the materials wet and the dry bag will keep books that are checked out dry Hopefully that, you know, rain will come, but, but it's a way to kind of recognize some of the barriers to access for people that don't have a home, the dry bag being the place where those materials can be kind of, you know, protected. And then the friends also were willing to fund a couple of ADA accessible computers, a kind of standard practice within, you know, best practice within libraries is to have at least one ADA accessible computer um in the library that is height adjustable for wheelchair access has a screen reader has magnification and other you know accessible features built in um to to you know provide ease of use to the entire population um you, you know i i had heard recently instead of saying abled people it's like temporarily abled because everyone you know arguably will become disabled and it's not for other people it's for all of us and thank you to the friends for that funding request 
Um, did I leave anything out, Susan? <laughs> um, oh, Jamie's got a question. Henry, I was wondering if you think it is worth um, putting for the next meeting or to talk about it now. Um, I was really interested in hearing about the community wellness assistant. <gasps> Um, oh, yes. work in that process. I'd love, I don't know if you think. Yes. It's oh my gosh. I can't meeting. believe that, I can't believe that I forgot. Actually, our, our presentation about the community wellness assistant with Lynn Murphy is the um, mental health liaison with the city who's, who's instrumental in both, you know, run, you know, helping to support the service support area under the freeway. But before that, just kind of knowing all the people in the community experiencing homelessness and a, being part of the team to kind of hook them up to resources. She um, and I and the chief and Susan and HR worked together to come up with this new position, which is a temporary 20 hour position. We hired Jennifer Madrid and she's been in the position about two weeks. Um, she's actively um, hooking up with the the service providers in the community, Ritter House, St. Vincent's, went to the service support area, has has is, has worked closely with Lynn and Blue, the service comfort animal. Blue was a service dog with guide dogs, but was retired into a comfort animal with for police dispatch, but often accompanies Lynn, you know, when she's interfacing with the community. So really excited about the new model, you know, you know, going from a, a security guard to more of a social services approach. Um, and, and Jennifer's actively been kind of being onboarded and trained a little more, it's a little more challenging for her supervisor because we haven't done this before, but we're kind of like learning as we go. And then I was, what I was going to say is, is, is we've pre we're going to present this at the California Library Association in Sacramento as, as kind of a new take on you know library public safety partnerships, um, and and it's it's really kind of become clear to us that having more of a, of a kind of interaction and communication with Lynn Murphy really helps promote wellness in the community because she knows like like the backstory of many of our regular customers and we we can kind of be more nuanced in our approach to dealing with with people who may have challenges related to experiencing homelessness but not only that and and generally with regards to behavioral challenges so we're really excited about that um Jennifer works from Wednesday through Saturday is a student and the city I think the, the one of the other one of the they're looking at even getting another intern to help Lynn with the back end like unpacking tents and she's got a ton of responsibilities just to support the service support area That's so awesome. yeah super right. excited thanks for sharing thank you Henry any other questions or comments Gender, any public comment? Uh, yes, we do have an attendee. I'm going to read the script and see if they're uh, interested. If you wish to provide public comment and are watching this meeting through Zoom, please use the raise hand function to let us know you would like to speak. If you are participating by telephone and wish to provide public comment, please press star nine. When it is your turn to speak, you will be notified that the host is inviting you to participate. You will need to press star six to unmute yourself. Once you're unmuted, you will have three minutes to provide your comments. So I'm just gonna see if this person is interested. Uh, no, it doesn't seem like they're interested. Thank you, Gender. Okay, so I guess there's no more comments and that leads us to the next meeting date, which is March 8, 2022. And the future agenda topics are, or is, RFID tagging update. That is correct. Sorry, we pushed that back a couple of times because the RFID tagging was still in process and it should be finishing soon. And it's very fascinating. We have now a new technology for scanning books to check them out and check them in. Um, we have a bunch of RF and we'll be talking about that at the next meeting. 
So look, like, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> we will. Well, thank you, everyone. If that, if there's no other questions or comments, we can adjourn. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Basha. Thanks, Adriana. Bye, Cheryl. Bye, Susan. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.